and these are a subset of the integers, because these are just the whole numbers that are excluding the negative ones and excluding zero. So we have one, two, three, and so forth. And we see that positive integers are a subset of the integers, which are a subset of the rationals, which are a subset of the reals. And so now I'm going to talk about how do you measure the size of those sets. Now, if you have a finite number of elements in a set, so we have a set containing one, two, and three, it's easy to measure its size. You just count how many elements there are. But unfortunately, that breaks down when you deal with infinite sets. The positive integers have an infinite number of items because their numbers get arbitrarily large without end. Um, and because this is a subset of all these other ones, these other sets clearly also have an infinite number of items. And so we can't simply count them up. If we counted them, we'd always get the number infinity. Um, now maybe that's, you, you might just say, oh, well, the size of all these sets is infinity. But maybe we can do better than that. Maybe some infinities are larger than others, and we need a way of comparing these infinities. And so to do that, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce a new way of measuring the size of finite sets, and then I'm going to apply it to infinite sets. Because this way of counting elements doesn't work for infinite sets. So how do we do this? Well, we observe, if we have two sets, one, one containing 1, 2, and 3, and another containing A, B, and C, we know that the size of the set doesn't depend on the names we give to elements. Like, I could, if I had a bag of items, I could rename those items, and that wouldn't change the number of items in the bag, clearly. I mean, intuitively, the same applies to sets. Renaming or relabeling the items doesn't change the number of items. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this set, 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to rename its items A, B, and C. And notice now that it, had, it now is exactly identical to this other set, A, B, C. Having renamed it, we've made the op the, these two sets equivalent. And because of that, we conclude they're the same size. They're exactly the same set, so how could they not have the same size? And once again, renaming can't change the number of elements. So if this set is, is equivalent to this, but it only differs from 1, 2, 3 by re renaming the elements, clearly 1, 2, 3 has to have the same size as A, B, C. So now we're going to apply the same idea of measuring the, the relative size of sets, but we're going to apply it to these infinite sets. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to start out with the positive integers. I'm going to, I'm going to write down the first few of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. This list goes on forever. And I'm going to start relabeling re them or renaming them to turn them into the integers. And what I'm going to show is that although the positive integers are a strict subset of the integers, they're clearly more integers because the integers are just the positive integers plus the negative integers. Uh, I'm going to actually show that they're the same size. And to do that, I'm going to show that I can rename the positive integers to just turn them into the integers. So how do I do that? I start with the, the uh, positive integers, and I start renaming them in the following manner. I'm going to rename 1 to be called 0. I'm going to rename 2 to be called 1. I'm going to rename 3 to be called negative 1. 4 to be 2. 5 to be negative 2, and so on. So I keep flipping this pattern. So it'll be 3 and negative 3, 4, and, uh, and then negative 4 would come next, and so forth. And once I've done this, I know that all I've done is rename the integers, the positive integers. Every positive integer has been given a new name. But I notice now that the set I have left, it's just a set of integers. It contains all the positive and negative numbers as well as zero. So I've, tur I've converted positive integers into the integers. Therefore, they must be the same size because I've done nothing but rename the items. So we conclude that these two are the same size. So whatever an infinite size they have is the same. And another argument, I'm not going to go through it because it's, it's slightly more technical, can be used to show that, the, in fact, the rational numbers are also the same size as both of these other sets. So the, all of these have the same size infinity. And the real numbers, though, actually, it turns out, have a different size infinity, which can be shown through a, di through a different argument. You can show that there's, in fact, no way to do these, this relabeling to make the real numbers into the rational numbers or the, integers or the positive integers. So it turns out this is a different infinite size. Okay, so mathematicians give a name to these different infinite sizes. They call them uh, cardinal, number, cardinal numbers. So uh, this, this they call aleph zero, which is the first cardinal number, and it's an infinite number in some sense. And they call the size of the real numbers aleph one, which is a different infinity that's bigger than aleph zero. So now I'm going to pose a question to you. Does there exist a set x, any set x, such that its size is greater than L of 0, but smaller than L of 1. So I'm just simply asking whether there, we could ever imagine or construct a set that has a size bigger than all these sets, but smaller than this one. And this certainly sounds like a true-false question. It also certainly sounds like a mathematical question. 
It turns out, in some sense, that it is not, because it actually has no answer. This is a question with no answer. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you take those ba basic eight axioms that mathematicians use, um, you realize that this question is independent of those axioms, meaning there's no way to show it's true from the axioms, and there's no way to show it's false from the axioms. This has been proven. So what do we do? This seems very bizarre. So it turns out this statement of, uh, the statement that there doesn't exist such a set X in this property is known as the continuum hypothesis. And mathematicians have exactly three options. They can either say, the eight axioms are enough. Questions like the continuum hypothesis are just, we don't care about them. They're independent of math. Maybe they, you might even say they're not even mathematical questions at all, despite the, the fact they sound like mathematical questions. And we just reject all questions of that type. The second choice is the mathematicians will introduce a new axiom, known as the continuum hypothesis, as the ninth axiom, which says that no, there does not exist such a set, and then they move on with their lives. That, 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 they take that as an axiom. Um, the final option is to put the opposite of the continuum hypothesis as an axiom, and say, axiomatically, we assume that's, that there is at least one set X that has this property, and then we move on. Now, what does this do to mathematics? It seems rather strange that there's, dis there's and actually today, there's widespread disagreement, or at least there's some disagreement among mathematicians about which option is to be taken. Um, now, how do you choose which way to go? It's very, very difficult. And in particular, it's difficult because it's, difficult it's incredibly difficult to tie this question about the existence of such an infinite set to real world phenomena. It's very difficult to say that if we choose one version of math versus the other, we're going to get a math that's less useful or less applicable real world because this question is so far from real world questions. So some mathematicians have suggested that if you like a very rich, complex world of sets in your mathematics, then you should reject the continuum hypothesis because that creates these interesting sets like X and things get rather interesting. Um, other, uh, on the other hand, they say, if you like a clean, crisp mathematics um, that sort of has fewer sets but they're all sort of nicer, then you should accept the continuum hypothesis and say that these sets X don't exist. So this is all very troubling because it leads us to, okay, so there's this ninth axiom and there's a disagreement about whether to accept it or reject it. Um, if there's disagreement about this axiom, well, how did the mathematicians even agree on the first eight axioms? You know, what's so special about the first eight, eight and how can they really be sure that they're right in some sense? The answer is a little complex. In part, they can't be sure they're right because there's not just one way to axiomatize math. There's, a, in fact, different ways. There's, for example, there's another way, not using sets at all, but using category theory. So to say that they're right, well, they're, they're certainly not the only way to axiomatize things. Second of all, you have to, re you have to remember the history of, of where this all came from. Mathematicians started with a whole bunch of mathematical objects and theorems that had been built up through observing the world and modeling it, and then later through building a pure structure on top of that. And only much later did they ask, well, can we come up with axioms that, that we can derive the rest of math from? So what that means is those axioms inherently have built into them the theorems that they've proven before, or at least that they, they had thought were true before. And furthermore, those axioms have built into them the usefulness of math, because math was developed to be useful, and later the axioms that derive from that inherited that property of usefulness. They had to, because if those axioms didn't lead to the same theorems, they would have been rejected, and the other axioms would have been constructed instead. So in some sense, this eight basic axioms they're true, or they're right, in a sense, because they're useful, because they, they give us the math that we need to model the world. But they don't seem to be true in the sense of like fundamental truth, like you might like. Um, it seems more like a pragmatic justification, actually, in the end. Okay. So there's another, another thing I should mention about the axioms. I, I said that they talk about sets. Well, what is a set? I said it's a collection of objects. Well, what's a collection? Well, it's a group of things. So what I'm getting at here is that we can't actually define the word set. And you might say, oh, that's sort of a trivial objection. We can't define any words uh, without using other words, and those words are left undefined. But actually, this is a little bit of a deeper objection, because generally in math, yes, you define words with other words. But, but, for, but those other words have, or, are already defined or accepted as axioms.